are having a good time here in Smith Center. And you, and you might say, well, how's that possible? First of all, you guys need some self-confidence as a city because first few places we went to in town, we were saying, well, we just moved here. And everybody said, why? <laughs> I'm like, well, well, <laughs> we did make the right decision, didn't we? No, really, what we were after is a small town filled with good people, hard-working people, blue-collar people, farmers, uh, that kind of stuff. And we're raising our grandchildren right now. We're helping our daughter raise grandchildren. And we had bounced around and lived in some big cities, and that life was not for us, especially not for my wife. I'm pretty flexible, but uh, her and her daughter were raised around small-town Oklahoma and cattle, horses, and all that stuff. Country life is what they were looking for. And I personally don't think there's any better place to raise children and grandchildren than in, in places like this, especially as opposed to the larger cities. So that's one of the main reasons that we're out here. But right there, uh, up there with that at the top of the list is we just want to help. We just want to serve. We had reached a point where we had pastored for 24 years, and we didn't want to pastor anymore. We wanted a break from that. And I don't know that we, uh, I don't know that we'll ever pastor again. I just, when people try to, people try to confine you and put you in boxes and label where you're at and what you're doing, and I just don't want any of that put on me right now. I don't know how long we're going to be here. I don't even think in those terms. Um, we may be here from now on, as far as I know, you know, and, uh, but I don't know if somebody asked me, when are you going to start pastoring again? I don't know that I ever will. I mean, I just, I'm just rolling with what I feel right now doing what my bishop told me before he passed on. He prophesied over me and said, you're entering a season where you're going to have to learn to follow a compass and not a map. And a compass is just going to give you a direction. A map is going to have details. And man, if that has not proven true the last two years, we've just moved directions we felt pulled. And this is one of the directions we felt pulled. And somebody asked me while I was out ministering last month, how are you doing not being the number one guy in a church? And I'm like, I'd never asked to be that. I argued with God when he called me to pastor. I argued with him when he called me to preach. For several years, I ran from that. So was, I never asked for that. I never asked to be in charge of anything, so I'm doing just fine. In fact, I'm enjoying not even having a title <laughs> or a position. I'm just here to help. That's all it's about for me. So uh, this past week, I put a post on Facebook that uh, it was a Beverly Doolittle portrait. I want to show that to you real quick uh, because it, I think it's in my slideshow anyway. But it's, it's really interesting. I want you to see how many faces, just look at this, and if you know who Beverly Doolittle is, she's an artist that paints portraits and hides things in, in the portrait, and, and you just have to see how many horses you could see or how many faces you could see. And so look at this, take a quick look at this portrait and see how many faces you can see, and then I'll, I'll lay this out. Uh, I'll let him pull that up real quick, and I'll just do some scripture reading. What's that? 2 Corinthians 5.17 is where I'm going to be starting tonight while we're getting those pulled up. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a very familiar text. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Sounds pretty settled to me right there. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be, uh, be, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I've often made this statement, the word behold is an invitation to see things from his perspective. Whenever you see that, there's uh, 1 John 3, 1 says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. And you have to be able to see things from his perspective to ever get a grasp on how much he loves humanity. And let me just individualize that. To ever really discover how much he loves you personally, you have to be able to see that from his perspective. Uh, this is another one of those texts, behold all things have become new. They're not, it's not, they're, they're not hard to see necessarily. They're just hard to understand if you're looking outside of his perspective. You're not looking through his lens, understanding and loving with his heart and seeing with his eyes. And so a matter of fact, when you ask somebody nine times out of 10, when you ask them, uh, how do you see? Most of the times they say, I see with my eyes. And, and the truth of the matter is you don't see with your eyes. You see through your eyes. You see with your brain. 
your brain is what actually sees images and records them and tells you what you're looking at. Your eyes are just the lens that you look through. So God doesn't hide things from us. Uh, he hides things for us. Okay, and so I'm going to unpack that, and it looks like he's about to pull this up, because before I move any, any deeper, if you look at the portrait, look at the portrait real close, the longer you look at it, you begin to see more and more faces in it. And the first time I pulled it up and looked at it, I saw five or six pretty fast, but then I got to looking, and I, I ended up reaching 10, and I thought, well, that's, that's got to be just about it. I walked away from my desk, I went back later that afternoon, I looked again, and I got up to 11. And then 12, and pretty soon I, I concluded that there were 14 faces there. But people were messaging me, telling me, I see 15 and 16 there. So, and I don't know, I'm not going to question that, and I don't know Beverly, so I can't message her and ask her. <laughs> but I know there's a lot of faces in there, and it takes a different perspective and a different glance. And I realized that when I looked at my phone, which is much sharper, and it's, you know, my phone's a high-def phone, it's a high-dollar phone, of course, most of our smartphones are, and the screen on my phone, uh, I saw even more. I saw two more on that that I didn't even see on my computer, and so what I want to talk about is just is perspective, and I want to talk about how, how you can look at a thing, how a thing can be right there in plain sight, right in front of you, and you can be missing it. Not seeing it, not, miss, not, not understanding it, and not seeing it. So that's the thought I'm after. So in Proverbs 25 and verse 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. That sounds interesting. But remember, he's not hiding things from us, he's hiding things for us. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. So just in case you're thinking, well, now, wait a second, Pastor Mark, what's that got to do with me? He's talking about kings there. Well, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, is the song of the redeemed. And it says, and they sing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. He's talking to Jesus. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on earth. Where, where are we going to reign? On earth. On earth. Okay. <laughs> I just want to, just, just wanted that one text supports the series that Pastor Mike is, was in all month, last month, and the month before on the kingdom. Amen. We will reign on earth. So we are kings and priests unto our God. So in his eyes, we are royalty. We're a royal nation. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation unto him. So the glory of God is to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search it out. So what that means for you and I is that glory is released in our lives when we uncover precious revelational truths from the Word, not just from the Bible, but from the Word Himself, especially truths that reveal Christ in us and us in Him. So when you see Christ in us, you see Him in us and us in Him, that reveals things in your life that's really foundational and really formational, and quite literally, it's earth-shaking in your life. There are some revelations that I've gotten that I was so taken aback, my first reaction to them was my eyes just filled with tears, and I began to weep for a while and began to worship into that revelation that he had just shown me. Maybe it was something that he showed me in the Word about how he felt about me or about how he saw me or how he saw others. And then I began to let it transform me from the inside out. It began to transform my thinking and transform my beliefs from the inside out. So these are the truths that we struggle to see initially, but the longer you look at the portrait, the longer you look at Christ, the more clearly you begin to see because you're learning to see and you're learning to see from his perspective and you're learning to process and understand from his perspective. And once they're seen, they can't be unseen. And then you begin to wonder, like the portrait, what took me so long to see him? Now when I go back and look at that, I immediately see 14 faces right out of the gate. When I, but it took me several days of going back and looking on different screens to see that. And like I said, some people are saying they see 15 and 16 there. So my subject tonight is hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. That's what I'm going to talk to you about for a few minutes tonight. And I want to address this from a a psychological perspective first, and then I'm going to get scriptural, okay? So, so be patient through the first part if that stuff bores you. But we as humans, why do we as humans fail to see things that are in plain sight? You ever walked into a room to look for something before? Walked all through the room, swore it was not there, 
and then someone else <laughs> walks into the room, it's laying right there. What's the old saying? If it had been a snake, it bit you. You know, I've been told that several times, and my wife likes to give me a hard time and call me an old man whenever I do that, but I've got her doing it too, and especially kids. I mean, uh, kids, you know, they, they walk into rooms, and I don't even think they look sometimes, but they swear they're looking, and then we walk into the room, and there it is in plain sight. So what is it that causes us to fail to see things that are in plain sight? Well, the obvious top of the list answers are distraction and lack of focus. So that's right at the top, but I'm not even going to unpack those because those are so obvious that I really don't think those need to be explained and taught, okay? But distraction and lack of focus causes it. So if I walk, if, if she sends me into another room to go get something and I walk into the other room thinking about what I was in the middle of when she sends me to the other room, I'm distracted and I have no focus because I'm still thinking about what I was doing before. Now, guys are bad about that. And I, I can tell you, guys are bad about that, because there's a, sometimes she's looking at me and she says, are you even listening to me? <laughs> and I think, what a weird way to start a conversation. <laughs> the rest of you will get that later. <clears throat> but reflecting on, on our history, on humanity's history, that behavior transcends every arena that we operate in, from sports to business to religion to social, uh, the social realm to politics, and it's even seen in as something as simple as the revelation of a magician's tricks. Tricks. If you've ever seen a magician or an illusionist, how they they use the art of distraction and getting you to look where they don't want you to look, so something else is being moved, and then when you turn back to look there, your mind is blown. You know, and it's all happening right in front of plain sight, right out in the open. That's, that's the biggest part of the trick. And so what might seem surprising or shocking at first, in hindsight, is obvious. It just seems obvious. Well, why is that? So the reason why is because we're psychologically predisposed to having biases in our life. And these biases can lead, lead to blind spots, okay? So our experiences and the information that we absorb inform how we see the world around us every day. So I want to repeat that because that's very important. Our experiences and then the information that we absorb inform how we see the world around us every day. So just like if you were to take blinders, and you, there's guys in the room that would know more about this than me, and you but you, you say you've got horses on busy city streets and you want to put blinders on them. The reason why you're doing that is because the blind spots help keep them focused, less reactive to the potential distractions that might come into view, you know, and, and, and they can, that those can be good. Those blind spots can be good and there can be a safe aspect to them. They can help us make sense of this huge influx of data that's coming at us from every direction every day. Because remember, you're seeing with your brain, you're just seeing through your eyes. So a lot of information, a lot of information coming at us. So blinders are okay, but if we're not careful to consider where all we have these blinders or these blind spots, then they can keep us from vital information that might open up opportunities to us or might even reveal a threat to us. But if you're not aware of the blind spot there, then the threat might hit before you even have time to react or respond. So in psychology, there's a series of principles that are at work here, and I just want to unpack a few of them, and then we're going to get into some scripture, okay? But I think that this is, you know, I don't, I don't preach sacred and secular. I think it's all one. I think we're sacred and secular. I think we're spirit and body, right? And we have a soul, so I think it's just all one here. So we need to learn how it all works together. So... Number, number one, we tend to overweight information that confirms what we already believe, which results in what they call in psychology confirmation bias, confirmation bias. So we tend to overweight what we already know about a subject. Now, in, and we'll unpack this in the How to Study the Bible class, but in, in Bible school, they call that eisegesis as opposed to exegesis, because eisegesis is reading into the text but exegesis is pulling out of the text. Eisegesis reads into it, so you're approaching the text with a, with a preset notion or belief or idea of what that text means. How many of you know that's a blinder? So you're reading into that text, and you're only reading into it what you think it means, but to exegete a text is to draw out of the text everything that it could possibly mean, even if it contradicts what you think you already know. Problem is, that's frightening to a lot of people. 
especially when it comes to the Bible. But in life, in period, that's frightening to a lot of us, okay? So <clears throat> number two, availability bias is the tendency to give greater credence to information that's commonly held by a greater number of people in a group, even when the information is all from a single source. As long as, a great, as long as it's a greater number of people, then it makes us feel safer. And again, this is the bias that keeps so many in the Western church clinging to this fatal view of the end times, is because they believe that the majority of the mainstream religions and denominations embrace fatalism and futurism and dispensationalism and all that stuff. And so the major, since the majority of them believe in it, they can't be wrong, can they? You know? <laughs> So, so that's availability bias. Number three, desensitization bias, which is the tendency to project our own experiences onto others when predicting their feelings, and that can create blind spots as well. And what I mean is when we encounter someone who's had an experience that we've never had, then we tend to discount those experiences as being less valid or sometimes not even true at all. I'll give you one quick example. <clears throat> My Son-in-law is not my favorite person in the world right now because he walked out on his kids several months ago. Uh, but he was working with me a couple of years ago, and my son-in-law is African-American. And so, of course, the, the highlights of the news media they were playing every day was racism and, 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 and social justice and everything was being played out and, and all of the inequity that exists in society. And I'm not, I'm not here to comment on that right now. I'm just talking about something that I did witness with my son-in-law. So he's working with me, and at the same time, I was also asked to sit on a panel of apostles from around the world, and we were discussing white privilege, racism, systemic racism, things like that. And so I told him behind the scenes, I said, I don't have a lot of experience with that because I've never encountered that. And they said, well, that's the point. We want people from multiple backgrounds, multiple ethnicities and, and races, you know, even though there's really only one race and it's the human race, but there are a lot of different colors. There are a lot of different ethnicities. And so I sat on the panel, I participated in the conversation, but the day of the panel, I was at work, I was installing a water softener on a guy's house, the guy had a really nice house, six, $800,000 house in a historic district in Oklahoma City, and so I'm putting a water softener in, and he's dying to go to the lake. He's got his boat hitched to the truck, and, they're, and their ice chests are loaded, and they're ready to get out of there. He finally comes to me, and he says, listen, man, your company has worked for me for a long time. I trust you, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave. We're we're gonna hit the road and head to the lake. So when you're done and you've tested everything and you've bled the softener out, just do me a favor, just lock the door and just be on your way. Everything'll be okay. But then he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, But the young man that's working with you, I don't want him in my house by himself. And I thought, <laughs> that's interesting. And I looked at him, I said, Well, let me tell you something. He's my son in law. <laughs> and he immediately clammed up, you know. I said, not only is he, is he my son-in-law, but he's a pretty hard-working dude, and he's just here, he's just here to, to bust it out. He, you don't got to worry about him, okay? But I immediately recognized a bias, and it was an experience that I had never had up until that point because I'd never had anybody tell me before, I don't trust you in my house working. But that was the first time that day, and it just happened to also be on the day where I was sitting on a panel discussing white privilege and racism. So, you know, sometimes if we've never had an encounter or an experience, then a blinder could be put in place, and we can deny the existence of something that's, that's adversely affected someone else, even traumatically affected someone else. But we've never been affected by it, so we tend to lessen the reality of it. All right, it's getting tough in here, so let's move on from that. <laughs> Number four is attention gap bias. Attention gap bias keeps our brains focused on one thing so we can complete a task, which is not necessarily bad, but in doing so, it can prevent us from seeing other things that may be happening around us. So the confluence of all of these natural biases that we've talked about they're what prevent us from absorbing, absorbing relevant data every day and validating new information that comes our way and, and keeping us from being able to, and, and we kind of complacently just rely on information from others 
rather than doing the diligent homework of studying it out for ourselves, especially if the others that we're listening to regularly are in our social group. Then we just kind of give credence to them. Well, they're, they're, you know, they're probably right. So physical blind spots can be dangerous, uh, like when your mirrors, you know, can't see that area beside your car. This morning, I was about to pull out of an intersection, and I looked, and it looked clear to me, and I started to gun it, and my wife said, Mark, and I slammed on the brakes, and a car drives right in front of me. She said, how could you not see that? But the little, the part of the windshield that comes down, they were right there when I looked, and so that's why sometimes, you know, the best way with blind spots like that is, is to proceed with caution and patience, right? And because when you're just in a big hurry, that's how accidents happen. You look real fast, you don't see anything, you pull out, bam, something happens, you know. And I've been there before, and it's happened to me, it's happened to a lot of us probably. But that's a blind spot right there, okay. But these other ones that we talked about are psychological blind spots. They can cause the failure of imagination, and they might have dire consequences in sports, like I said, in business, in social settings, in politics, and even in relationships. So how do we remove blind spots, right? That's got to that's gotta be the number one question. Well, first of all, just acknowledging that we all have them, that's the first step. Acknowledging that we all have them is the first step, and then being diligent in seeking information that doesn't always match our beliefs, okay? So what I've started doing, the thing, and this will come up in how to, how to study the Bible class, but the thing that really revolutionized my study life about 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, was I stopped studying Scripture to support what I already know, and I just started studying Scripture to see Jesus every day, to encounter Him, even if it contradicted a previous belief system. And what I did personally, and I'm not telling you everybody has to do this, but I was, I was in a period of my life where I took two years off from preaching at that time, not just from pastoring, two years from preaching, and I just sat in an office and studied, and I found it remarkable how wrong I was on all of the stuff that I thought I had known the first 15 years I'd been preaching. You know, so I was like, we were moving at that time. Somebody found a whole bunch of cassette tapes and said, Pastor, what do you want to do with these? These are good. I said, throw them in the trash. And they said, what? How could you throw that away? I said, that stuff's 15 years old. I've changed my belief since then. I don't even believe that way anymore. I don't want people getting a hold of that and, and listening to that and hearing that from 15-year-old data, 15-year-old information, 15-year-old revelation. You know, I don't want that, so let's hit the trash can with it. So when, we, when we're diligent about seeking information that doesn't match our beliefs, the tension points are where you can find insight. Tension points. And you'll know them. Because when they pop up, you're going to be offended right out of the gate. It's that area where you get offended. That's a tension point, okay? So, and you've also got to be willing to step out of your normal, normal routines and go outside your usual circles, you know, to, to seek out different points of view and feedback. So what I started doing is going to different conferences, different, reading books from different guys that I wouldn't have normally read before. And you think, you might be tempted to think, and what I had been told by the denomination that I was part of for a long time is, you can't do that, you know, you can't stick your head through the fence and graze from the other side of the fence, you're going to get brainwashed if you're not careful. But then I really realized most of us need our brains washed. We need to learn to renew our minds, and you, you, I don't need people telling me what to think, I need people teaching me how to think. And I never, ever... In the, especially the last 12 years, have wasted any time trying to tell anyone I've been teaching what to think. I just want to equip you and teach you how to think and then let you discover him on your own because you will encounter him. You'll encounter the Holy Spirit on your journey. You'll encounter the heart of the Father. You'll encounter Jesus, the love of Jesus, and he'll reveal himself to you in transformative ways that will blow your mind. And you might not even be sitting in a church service when it happens, Right? So last of all, rest, rest, R-E-S-T, rest is a salve for blind spots in our life. And here's what I mean. Studies show that our willpower or the ability to make dispassionate, informed choices diminishes greatly when we're exhausted. <laughs> so fatigue can prevent us from being attuned to key pieces of information. How many of you know that that's true in your life? I mean, it's true in my life for sure. When I'm tired, I don't want to decide. I don't want to make a decision, especially if it's an important decision, okay? So here's what I'm really after, okay? Because I wasn't trying to just 
delay and detour there, but this is what I'm really after. I've heard it said before, I've thought it myself more times than I can count. I really do want to see myself as the righteousness of God in Christ. But it's so hard to understand, much less believe, and that makes it difficult for me to see. Makes it difficult for me to see. So we started off in Corinthians talking about if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, right? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All things are new. I want to believe that. I want to understand that, and I want to see that in my life. But the problem is it's incredibly difficult to see at times, and it's enough of a struggle for us to believe that we're living in a new creation now, much less that we're living as a new creature, but that's what the text says. Not only are we in a new creation, we are a new creature in Christ. That means the world has never seen anything like us on this side of the cross. Everyone who lived prior to the cross is different from everyone who lived after the cross. The Holy Spirit did not indwell humanity before the cross. But he did afterwards. He came upon people in the Old Testament, but he moved into people in the New Testament. So now we live life from the inside out. We house the spirit of the living God on the inside of us. That is the new man. That's the new creation right there, okay? So it's true that it can be very hard to see if you're looking for the wrong person. I want to explain, okay? Every Easter, every Resurrection Sunday, We celebrate that glorious morning of an empty tomb. You notice I said the word empty. There was no old Jesus to be discovered. There was no revived or patched back together Jesus in some sort of Frankenstein way. An old Jesus, but he had new life flowing from that old body. But that that former earthly Jesus was gone. He was gone. When they rolled back the stone, he was gone. Something that happened that we tend to miss or, or overlook at times is this. The Bible says Jesus was the first new man, first new man, okay? It says he was the firstborn from the dead. He was the first fruit. It calls him several different firsts, but Colossians 1.18 identifies him as the first new man. Now, he wasn't the first to be raised from the dead, and he wasn't the last to be raised from the dead, but he was the first to ever be raised from the dead and never die again, <laughs> Everyone else, including Lazarus, that was raised from the dead, died again and was put back into the ground. He never died again. That's what makes him the first new man, okay? So another thing that Scripture reveals about this new creation man was that Jesus was hard for his friends to recognize. Let me just take you back and just recall, you just jog your memory a little, because you know these stories probably, you've read them before, but he, his friends at times had a hard time recognizing him. And, and Pastor Mike touched on it last week on the road to Emmaus. They didn't know who he was. It was though he had an ability to conceal himself during their interactions. Then at the right time in the conversation, pff, he revealed himself. And usually it was when he steered the conversation away from the realm of fact and landed it on truth. Then all of a sudden he revealed himself. Can I show you? Have I got your interest now? At the tomb. He's there talking with Mary Magdalene. She initially thinks he's the gardener. She says, sir, can you show me where they've laid his body? She thought him to be the gardener. So the fact is she was witness to his death and burial three days earlier. The truth is he was risen from the dead and he's alive forevermore. So she didn't recognize him standing right in front of her, which tells me something about him was different. Even though the disciples had seen him a few times after the resurrection... They still didn't immediately identify him. They were out fishing one day, if you remember. They're coming in from a toiling all night, and he's there with a fire built already. And he says, bring the fish in and let let me cook for you. And they said, we don't have, you remember the story from from the end of John, John 20 or 21? And they don't recognize him until he breaks bread. He cooks the fish and breaks the bread and prays. Then they know who he was. So the fact was they had denied and forsook him in his hour of need. But the truth is, and he still and still is, he never forsakes us in ours. I want you to see that while the facts are on display, they're not recognizing this new man, Jesus. But as soon as he gets them shifted away from the realm of fact onto the realm of truth, a revelation happens and they realize, oh my God, it's him. It's him. This is really him. Pastor Mike talked about this last week, the two travelers when they're walking along the road to Emmaus, which by the way, 
most theologians believe this was theologians believe this was his aunt and uncle. Cleopas was his uncle and, and his wife, which makes it even more ironic that they don't recognize him, okay? They're walking down the road to Emmaus for miles with him, and they have no clue who he is until late in the day when he sets down with them and breaks bread and prays. Then the Bible says their eyes were opened, right? Their eyes were open. We, we heard about it last week. The fact was they had lost all hope when he died. If you remember when the conversation starts on the road, they said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not heard what happened, how they crucified our Lord Jesus? You know, so facts, they're talking facts. But then when he's sitting with them, he begins to open scripture and expound on himself from Moses moving forward. And then when he prays and breaks the bread on the foundation of truth, replacing fact, they're like, oh my God, that's him. He is here, and he sets our hearts on fire when he reveals himself. So why do they keep struggling to see him when he's standing right there with them? It's, it's, that's what I'm talking about, hidden in plain sight. Well, it possibly might be, just like I stated, they've, he's shifting them from the realm of fact to the realm of truth so they could see a spiritual savior. But another reason may have been this. It's hard to recognize the new man if you're still looking for the old one. So allow me to ask you the same question that the angel asked the woman at the tomb, the women at the tomb when they come to look for him. The, the question was, why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> Pretty good question, don't you think? Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's hard to see the Christ in you when you're looking in the graveyard of our old man who's dead. And that's what so many believers do today, and that's why hidden in plain sight is the revelation that they're a new creature in Christ. But they're looking in the graveyard of Adam, who is dead and buried, is no longer around, and you can't see the new man, Jesus, in, an old, in a graveyard, in an old Adam graveyard. You just can't do it. You're raising your hand. Do you have a... Okay, I will. It's hard to see the Christ in you when you're looking in the graveyard of your old man who's dead. Pastor Mike is okay with it. I, I don't mind sharing notes. So I just all I need is an email address, and I'll, I'll share those with you. Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, let's unpack this principle for a few minutes here, okay? Colossians 3 says, and let, I'm going to read it from the message real quick, it says, verse 3 and 4, your old life is dead, that sums it up, <laughs> your old life is dead, your new life, which is your real life, by the way, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. Somebody say amen. amen. When Christ, your real life, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. Now, before you go thinking he's talking about this massive return of Christ back to the earth one day, you need to do a little word search, which is this is what we're going to talk about for a few weeks, you know, as we get into this next month. The word search there isn't about a literal Jesus coming back and setting his feet on the planet again, but it's, it's the word in the original language that phrase shows up is translated manifests, appears. Now, I don't know about you, but he's manifested in my life more times than I can count over the years. He's appeared I've had people come up to me before and, and give me offerings when I was praying about a need that we had in our life. Jesus just appeared. He just manifested through someone else. That's, that's him meeting a need through them. That, that's Christ is what that is. Can I tell you that you guys were that at one point? I mean, we were here two years ago when we were getting ready to leave Oklahoma. You guys received a very large, generous offering from my wife and I on the way out. And Pastor Mike, even his mind was even blown when he handed it to me that next morning before we left town. He said, man, this is just amazing. And, and my mind was blown. What is it? That's an appearing of Christ is what that is. He appears through generosity. He appears through mercy. He appears through love. He appears through all of us. As a matter of fact, no, I'm not going to get onto that. If we spend less time looking for one man, Jesus, to show back up on the planet and start seeing him in everyone around us, then the body of Christ would stand up and begin to impact this earth. Amen? The voice translation, I don't know if you've even heard of that one. That's an obscure one. But the voice translation says this, verse 2, stay focused on what's above, not on earthly things. Now, first of all, Above, below, up, down, you need to think dimensionally, not directionally. 
Because in Scripture, he's not talking about way up there in heaven. He's talking about the dimension that is heaven, that is all around us, okay, the spirit realm. Stay focused on what's above, not on earthly things, because your old life is dead and gone. Your new life is now hidden, enmeshed with the anointed one who is in God. On that day when the anointed one who is our very life is revealed, you will be revealed with him in glory. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever in character and in nature, but how he was with his friends on earth had changed completely, which apparently weirded them out because they didn't even recognize him. Matter of fact, he was walking through walls and doors without even having to use the doorknobs. There were things, he, was, he was just doing things that the natural man can't do, okay? More than one time following his resurrection, he had to say to them, be at peace, don't fear, be at peace. So I would say that he, they were a little weirded out by him, not recognize him, him until he began to talk truth to them. And because and, you remember what Peter had said when Jesus fed the 5,000 and he has this, this conversation with the disciples alone and the 5,000 leaves because the sermon gets really tough and almost weird. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And they're like, no, 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 we're out. So the whole crowd leaves and the disciples are all us there. Now he, he did that intentionally. Now most good teachers... <laughs> We try to back down off that statement. When you see you're losing your audience, you try to, well, I didn't mean literally, but then he repeats it again and says it even harsher the second time. What he's trying to do, he, he wasn't there to be crowned king. He was not there to win a popularity contest and to sit on a literal throne. So he did things to intentionally, he fed the crowd, he healed the crowd, he loved the crowd, but he also ran them off when the time came because the 12 was his assignment. The 12 was his assignment, so he wanted to be alone with them, to pour into them, and he asked them a question, will you go also? And what was Peter's response? Only you have words of life. So it's when we hear the words of life that we recognize him, and we realize for the first time, he doesn't look like what I thought he would, and he may be talking through someone I didn't think he would talk through. He may be moving in a situation I never imagined he was capable of moving through, but the one thing we do recognize, the words of life. <laughs> when he speaks the words of life and the words of truth, we come alive to that. Our spirit bears witness to his spirit. Are we doing okay? All right. You promise. Is anybody completely lost and confused right now? You wouldn't admit it if you were anyway, would you? <clears throat> so you're going to have to learn to look with your new creation eyes, not your old ones, if you're going to find the new man manifesting in your life, Okay. So our old man lenses, if we could call them that, are clouded with doubt and fear and worry. If you think about it, Saul, before he became Paul, you know, the traditions that he had, that were, he was gripped by, the religious idea, ideas that he had, blinded him. He was zealous for God, but they blinded him to who Jesus was until Jesus meets him on the road and knocks him <laughs> off his you-know-what and says, why are you persecuting me? And then he begins to see through the process of going to Ananias, and he receives his sight. But religious traditions can blind us to how amazing Jesus is and how transformed we are. And they can sound pro-God, but be anti-Christ the whole time. I mean, they'll use scripture to preach it and to back it up, and they'll beat the hell out of people with Bible verses, but it's pro-God, but it's anti-Christ, and it's not finished work, and it doesn't free anyone. It doesn't transform anyone. It doesn't, it doesn't move people into faith, from fear into faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, the literal translation is the hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes from the message regarding Christ. That's the literal translation. It's not faith comes from the message of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes from the word of God. It's the word of Christ is what the literal translation says there. That's another thing you'll pick up in the How to Study the Bible class. I'm not, I'm not picking bones, but I, I just want you to know, and you can probably recollect with me, I've sat in church services and heard messages about God that didn't really build faith in my life. In fact, I left the room feeling kind of bad about myself and feeling like I got to do better. I got to try harder. You know, I mean, but I never let, but, but those messages never caused me to leave the room thinking I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a new creation. They never really adjusted my beliefs. Okay. 
Later on in his life, that same Paul who had that transformational experience, the, the scales came off of his eyes. Later on in his life, he's the guy who is pinning Ephesians chapter 1, and he says towards the end of that chapter in his prayer, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Why? What do we need to see? He goes on to explain what he needs us to see, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, where, where is it? It's in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. So the implication there is, if your eyes are not open, you may never truly know or experience all that God has done for you and in you. So he's praying that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened or be opened, okay? So how does that happen? Does that happen from us trying harder to be better Christians? No, it happens. He goes on to tell you it happens according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one which is to come. Now, that's just direct quotes from Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. So if I'm looking from an earthbound perspective, trying to discover the fullness of life in Christ, it could be right in front of me and I'll never see it. I'll never see it. I'll walk through life with it hidden right there in plain sight. But uh, why? Because I'm looking for a problem-solving graveyard. I'm looking in a problem-solving graveyard for a Jesus who's not even there. He's not in that problem-solving graveyard, okay? He's not in the graveyard of Adam. He's not in the graveyard of performance-based religion. He's not there. They buried him in it, but he came out a new creation, amen? A brand new man. So if he's not there, then we're not there because we started off tonight by saying, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So we're in Christ. Somebody say amen. Let me just unpack this, okay? Colossians 3.3 3 says that your old life was dead and gone. Your old life is dead and gone. So what he says there is his death was your death. His burial was your burial. His resurrection was your resurrection. His ascension was also your ascension. So positionally speaking, we're now seated with Christ in heavenly places. Paul says that in Ephesians a couple of times. He says it again in Colossians. We're seated with him in heavenly places. So I know that's hard to understand, but it's only because we're seeing from a limited wrong-sided perspective. So let's just unpack it for a few more minutes. I want to make sure you understand what it means to be seated with Christ in heavenly places, okay? The word retroactive, it's a word we toss around in our language quite a bit, but it's really a legal term. It's legal terminology, and it refers to a, a, a legislation, a legal term or legislation used to describe activity that is enforced because of and all the way back to a date in the past. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Let me just give you a case in point. My wife filed for unemployment a few years ago because she was wrongfully terminated from a place, and the place fought it, even though they were going to lose it, and they did lose it, but when she finally did get approved, they, she got a deposit into her account for the amount that was four months' worth of unemployment that she had been waiting on that whole time. That's retroactive payment. So I know you know what I'm talking about, but I'm just trying to help you wrap your mind around the premise. What happened on the cross was a retroactive work. <laughs> what happened when he came up out of the tomb was a retroactive work. It's legal speak is what it is, and it has to do with something that is enforced because of and all the way back to a date in the past. How many of you know that date was 2,000 years ago? Retroactively, that's why this works the way that it works. Jesus is seated above the noise and the buzz of circumstance and situation and panic. He's seated above all of that. And when I inhabit my seat next to him in praise and worship and thanksgiving, then I'll start learning to recognize him and his ways because I'm learning to look through new man eyes. New man eyes, okay? And from that place, you'll begin to discover that those new man ways, they're not so hidden after all. They're right there in plain sight. Right there in plain sight. You were just feeling with the wrong filter or looking with the wrong lens, okay? And... <clears throat> When we look through the wrong lens and we think with the wrong filter, then our perceptions, our emotions deceive us into believing that it's only in the next life that we'll truly taste victory. And when we walk in that kind of darkness, and that is darkness, 
to walk believing that the only way I'll ever taste victory is in the next life is spiritual darkness and blindness. It absolutely is, okay? When we walk in that kind of darkness, we actually begin waiting on death to set us free from this world of pain and struggle. Not realizing that it was a death that set us free 2,000 years in our past. So we're free right now. If any man, it was for freedom that Christ made us free. Or we think this one, we think we have to die daily to keep the old man where he belongs in the graveyard. You guys are chuckling, but you know what I'm talking about. This is t-shirt stuff right here. People have to, people talk about us dying daily because Paul said it, we got to die daily. But you know, when you overemphasize that dying daily part, and I've heard Lynn say this before, you're putting more, you have more faith in the resurrection of Adam than you do the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the old man died, just leave him dead. Leave him in the ground, quit raising him up, resurrecting him, and acting like he has any influence in your life anymore whatsoever, okay? Paul did not say that we have to die daily. What Paul said was, I face death daily as an apostle who is preaching the gospel for your sakes. That's what he said. That's the literal translation of what he said. So we've taken that, and then we've kind of taken it out of context. Jesus said something similar. He said, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. But he was talking about learning to, to identify with and live the crucified life. You do have to deny yourself, absolutely, okay? And you do have to understand, when he says take up your cross, he's not talking about we all got to be crucified to get to heaven. He's talking about identifying with what happened at the cross, identifying with him, okay? So when we put all the value on the afterlife, we, we fail to experience the abundant life right now, in the here and now. So I'm just, I'm going to find a stopping point here, and then I'm going to open it up for some dialogue, okay? And when we do that, we, we fail to see that his death in our past has already set us free from an old order, an old system, an old world, and even your old man. So why do so many Christians struggle to receive grace and live a victorious life then? Well, I believe it can be narrowed down to one of two reasons. First, they're not properly valuing what Christ accomplished on the cross, so they don't really understand the finished work. Or second, they don't know what happened to them on the cross, right? Now, before I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, and then we'll stop. <clears throat> what happened to them, every believer knows that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, but not every believer knows or at least understands that they died too. See, it just got quiet in the room. Because we want to automatically in our minds say, well, I wasn't there. But you were there in Christ. <laughs> okay? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those, those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And, and the, the, the preaching or the message there is the Greek word logos, which on the surface just means the spoken or the written word of God, but it also means the communication of or the communication of who God is and what God is like. Who God is and what God is like. So he says the preaching of the cross is foolishness, but, but to those of us who are called, well, let me, just, let me just read it. Pick up at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, so he cannot be known through wisdom alone. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now check this out. For the Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And the reason why that world had such a problem with it in that culture was because to the Jews, it was a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it was foolishness, utter foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Let me give you a couple of scriptures here real quick, okay? Romans 6, 8 says, and if we were co-crucified with the anointed one, we know that we also share in the fullness of his life. Now, that's the Passion Translation. Colossians 2, 20, first part of the verse says, For you were included in the death of Christ and have died with him to the religious system and powers of this world. Don't retreat back to being bullied by the standards and opinions of religion. That's a good one, ain't it? <laughs> 
Colossians 3, 3, the first part of that verse says, your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tide of this life, and now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. So we seem to have no problem knowing that he died. We understand that. But there's a disconnect with most believers when you try to convince them that they also died. That they died, and if they died, they were buried. And if they were buried, they too were raised. And if they were raised, then they too were ascended with him and seated in heavenly place. Now, how can that be possible? We have no memories of the nails, the cross, or the crowd that day. So how can it be possible? But this is where, this is why the Greeks call it foolishness and the Jews call it a stumbling block. This is where we have to learn to take him at his word. We have to learn to take him at his word. If faith comes by hearing, but hearing only comes from the message regarding Christ. So until you understand and begin to identify, the more you hear the right message, the more you begin to believe it. So Jesus died for the whole world, right? We know that he died for the whole world, and you and I are part of the whole world. So we started in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We started at verse 17. Let me go back to verse 14 and just read this. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for them who died for them, for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, somebody say from now on, from the cross moving forward, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. I mean, Mike, to me, that text should sum it up that we need to stop looking for a physical Jesus walking around on the planet somewhere because he says right there, we don't know him after the flesh no more, any longer, okay? So we're not going to look through a lying lens anymore that tells us that we're not new, nothing has changed, we're still battling with an old nature, we're battling to keep that old nature down. What we're battling with, are you ready for it, is a memory. What we're battling with is a memory, which is why renewing the mind is the key to walking in victory. It's the memory of the old man that we battle with. And preachers that are still preaching us under law and condemnation, they keep preaching us under a government of death, a government that shuts up faith, it damns up faith so that we'll never be able to, if that's the message you said and listened to, you will never be able to believe you're a new creature in Christ. You have to run from that. I used to be bothered by it, but I tell people now really plain, if that's the preaching you're setting under, you pray about it, but I would run for my life if I were you. Because that preacher needs a revelational encounter in his own life still. And I was that preacher 12 or 14 years ago. You know, I was that guy. You're battling with a memory, and so you need to learn to renew your mind. Now, if anyone is enfolded in Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that's related to the old order has vanished Behold, somebody say behold, look through the right lens, embrace his perspective, everything is fresh and new. So when we trust his representative death, then we're included in it. We're included in it, amen? I have more to say, but I think, I think it's time. Now, I mean, it's time, it's time. I just want to have some dialogue, okay? I don't want to be these guys, and I can be these kind of guys.